Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and this study by Brother Stephen Miller titled, How to Get the Holy Spirit. This study picks up where Stephen left off with his previous study and is a basic survey of the book of Acts showing the Bible student that there are different requirements at different points during the Acts transition until we see a completion of the transition in the end of the Acts account which reflects the Pauline doctrine of the Holy Spirit found in his epistles. These matters will be clarified for the listener as you follow the study with Brother Steve. But if you have any questions, comments, or prayer requests, please send those by email to bbbfohio at yahoo.com or you can send them by U.S. Postal to P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. And be sure to use a stamp. And now we begin this study by Brother Stephen Miller, titled, How to Get the Holy Spirit. This is part one of two. So, um, actually, what we're going to talk about today is uh, something important last... Uh, I think it was the last time I taught, we talked about uh, some of the changes in the book of Acts going from Jew to Gentile. And then what we're going to talk about now is getting the Holy Spirit. Okay. So when I told Greg yesterday that uh, he was like, he's like, what are you going to teach on? I'm going to teach on how to get the Holy Spirit. You know, or actually it's the Holy Ghost. We're going to get the Holy Ghost. So, you know, we, we obviously, we come from more of a Baptist background, less char charismatic. Um, not at all charismatic, actually. I don't think anybody, you know, but there are some people, you know, maybe they get wrapped up in that kind of thing. Charlie was actually talking to a person at work um, who he used to be charismatic or something. Raised. Apostolic. Raised apostolic. I guess there's a difference. But um, one of the things, when I worked at Wendy's, I talked to this lady. Um, she was actually a manager um, with me. I was, I was a manager and she was a manager. We were in the same store. It was kind of kind of interesting because it's the first time I had ever met somebody who was apostolic or charismatic or or um, or whatever. And you know, she she was a nice young Christian lady, um, you know, a uh, good manager, you know, that kind of thing. Nothing against her, really. You know, she's a good Christian lady. But one of the things, though, you know, we we would talk about things, you know, because you you know you're sitting there making sandwiches all day for ten hours a day, you you want to talk about stuff. So we would talk about doctrine. And it was interesting because at the time I didn't really know very much. You know, I was just kind of like, you know, what, what, what do you, you know, what do you believe? And, and I was like, you know, where's this speaking in tongue thing? You know, where are you speaking in tongues? Where's that come from? And, uh, and she was like, oh, Acts 2.38. And so I was like, you know, that's where you get, I was like, where do you get the authority to do that? Acts 2.38. So um, I didn't really know anything about it at the time. I was like, oh, okay, well, let me you know, I, I went home and I did, did a little bit of research, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I couldn't really refute her at the time or anything like that. It was, it was, but it was, it was kind of interesting because that, that's how most of my, that's, that's where most of my sermons come from, is actually me talking to somebody else about something and then being completely blown away by whatever they say and then saying, well, what's the Bible say? So it's one of the reasons why I became King James only was from talking to a Muslim. It's like, well, gee whiz, if you're going to be, if you're going to go out and you're going to go witness to people, you know, you can witness to people with a, a new international version or an ESV or whatever, but they're going to say, well, gee whiz, you have a, you have a corrupt Bible, and they're going to be right if you, if you witness with that. If you go witness to Muslims, Muslims know more than you. That's, yeah. just, that's just a fact. They study every day. They're taught from little kids, and they know, they know your Bible. Yeah. They know where it comes from. They know all about it. Yeah. And they're just slightly deceived, slightly. But they're very, very good at what they do. So you need to know, you need to know where your Bible comes from. You need, you need to know these things so that you can actually uh, witness to Muslims. People forget about the Muslims. They're just too hard or whatever. But they're like, oh, let's just go preach Jesus. Let's not worry about the King James Bible issue or anything like that. The problem is if you just go preach Jesus and not worry about the King James Bible issue, you're going to run into a lot of people who do know about the Bible issue. And it's going to be a problem. So um, 
So I'll just get started, I guess. So we're going to talk about giving, the giving of the Holy Ghost. And um, there's actually, um, it's kind of an interesting uh, study. There's actually at least four different times uh, in Acts where the Holy Ghost comes upon people and then they speak in tongues or, or whatever. Uh, thing, different things happen, actually. Um, so if rightly divided, the book of Acts is a simple book to understand. Very, very simple to understand if you rightly divide the book of Acts. Wrongly or not divided, it's a mess. Um, it will lead to confusion and hatred for Christianity. That's where Charlie's co-worker is. He hates Christianity. I don't know him very well, but he doesn't want to be a Christian because he's confused. So... Uh, Ex-charismatics, ex-Catholics. I've talked to many ex-Catholics who they just don't rightly divide the Bible, and therefore they're confused, and therefore they don't they, they think that their Bible that the Bible contradicts itself. So, um, ex-Baptists, they they if you don't rightly divide the Bible and you're a Baptist, you will be confused, especially if you actually read your Bible. You'll be very confused if you don't rightly divide your Bible. So we're we're actually commanded in Second Timothy two fifteen commanded to divide our Bible. Divide. Yeah. That's not some archaic word where it's like study. It doesn't mean study. It means divide. So it actually means cutting something up. If you're going to divide a steak, you're going to cut your steak, and then you're going to eat your steak. If you're going to divide a pizza, you divide your pizza. Division. It's the key to understanding science, understanding your Bible, understanding language, understanding everything, is to put things into their proper category. So, ex-Baptists usually can trace their biblical, okay, ex-Charismatics, ex-Catholics, ex-Baptists, et cetera, can usually trace their biblical confusion to either the book of Acts, the book of Matthew, or the book of Hebrews, and sometimes James. So it's kind of like a E I O U, and sometimes Y. So it's Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, and sometimes James. So, and that's because they don't rightly divide. And if you, if you want to know more about that, Greg's got tons of material on that on, online. Um, and not being able to explain the apparent contradictions between, say, Acts 2.38 and Acts, uh, one, or Acts 16.31. You've got problems there. Go, go ahead and turn to, we'll, we'll, we'll look at one of these contradictions. Look at, uh, go to turn to Matthew 17, or no, Matthew 19. So, Matthew... 19, go to Matthew 19, 17. And uh, actually go to Matthew 19, 16. And we'll read it with me whenever you get there. So also, okay, so hold in your hand Matthew uh, 19, 16, and then turn to uh, Acts 16, 31. We're going to look at an apparent contradiction in your Bible. I say apparent because it's not a real contradiction, it's just an apparent contradiction. Acts, Acts, Acts 16.31. So in Acts, or I'm sorry, so in Matthew, Matthew um, 19.16, it says, and, and says, uh, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, what, what commandments do you think he's talking about there? Like the Ten Commandments. Keep the law. Keep, keep do what they say. And what do they say? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Uh, honor thy mother and thy father. Um, thou shalt love thy God. Uh, and so on and so forth. So um, you, you follow the feasts. You know, that, that's, uh, that's a commandment also. So in Acts, uh, th so you keep the commandments to have what? Eternal life. That's what it says. Let's get to Acts uh, 1631. And then we have... Acts 16.31, it says... Um, and they said, I'm sorry, let's go to Acts, um, 
1630. It says, uh, uh, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So, is that keeping the commandments? No. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. What, what is being saved? It's having eternal life. So, there's an apparent contradiction because one says do the law, and then the other one says just believe. So, believe on Jesus. So, it's an apparent contradiction because there's a division. So, you have to rightly divide between one dispensation and the other dispensation. Right. You have to actually say, hey, what, well, what happened? Well, Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's what happened. Amen. So you believe on Jesus. What all happened there was um, actually the sin of the world was put into him and it was killed. All you have to do is believe on that and then you're saved. So he, filled the com he fulfilled the commandments and then you just take his righteousness. That's basically just what happens there. Amen. So it's actually a fulfillment of the law to believe on Jesus in, in that sense. So, okay, so that's, that's just one example of where that's been thrown in my face, you know, by um, people. I won't, I won't name specific groups or whatever. But it's, uh, hey, you know, this is, what, this is what it says. You know, do you follow Jesus? It says, hey, keep the commandments. You know, but uh, they don't they don't understand that Jesus actually died and rose from the dead. I, what's interesting is they call themselves Christians also. So one of the uh, one of the things about Acts is that it has to be rightly divided. And there there's a couple things about the book of Acts that I, I just wrote down that, that just um, should be kept in mind when when studying the book of Acts, because you'll be confused if you don't keep these certain things in mind. So Acts one. OK, so. The first thing is, Acts is not a doctrinal book. It should not be your go-to book for the doctrine for the church age. Um, it's a book of actions. That's why they call it Acts. Yeah, history, yeah. History is a propagation of actions. So it's the Acts of the Apostles, not the doctrine of the Apostles. So it's, it's amazing the title really just clears it up. So Acts is a transitional book transitional from the Jew to the Gentile. You're transitioning from the, uh, the Jew being the main focus of the Bible to then being the Gentile in the ministry of Paul being the focus of the Bible. So Acts was written to bring a Christian, that Christian is Theophilus. Acts was written to bring a Christian up to speed on the reason why we now believe in salvation by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for all. So Acts was actually written by Luke to a guy named Theophilus. And it's, uh, you go to uh, Acts 1.1, it says, hey, you know, Theophilus, I'm writing this book to you just like I wrote the, or writing this to you just like I wrote the last one. And that last one was the book of Luke. So it's actually like Luke is like a part one, part two. You have Luke and then Acts. It's a part one, part two of the same thing. So what we will, uh, or what, what I will show today, is the differences in giving, in, I'm sorry, in the differences in giving of the Holy Ghost. Um, yeah, what I will show today is the differences in giving of the Holy Ghost. So there's change upon change um, with this. So one way uh, to get the Holy Ghost in one uh, chapter is different from uh, the way in the next chapter, and then it's different in the next chapter, and it's different in the next chapter. No charismatic can say this is the way or this is the right way to have the second, second working of grace, which is actually not even found in the Bible. There is no such thing as the second working of grace in the Bible. It's never in there. Um, you can't ever show it to me. What you can show to me is where people get the Holy Ghost by doing certain things. That's, that's in the Bible. I mean, that I'm not going to say it's not. So when the charismatic or Baptist... Uh, doesn't rightly divide the Bible, he brings doubt to everyone who actually studies their Bible. So if you, um, if you don't rightly divide your Bible and you say, hey, this is the right way, Acts 2.38, let's go there, go to, go to Acts 2.38. If you say that this is the right way, we'll, uh, we'll just go with that. You know, let's, let's act like 
that is the right way to get saved. Or that's the right process, you might say, to get the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, actually. So, let me get rid of that. Let's go to Acts 2.38. So, Acts 2.38, you guys all there? So, we talked about this quite a bit. It says, uh, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, what are the two requirements there? Actually, there's three requirements. In, uh, so, to, to get the Holy Ghost, in Acts 2.38, that's, that's what was thrown in my face when I said, what gives you authority to speak in tongues, or, or gives you, you know, what, what is your salvation message? Uh, you know, what is this? Um, that's what I asked her, really, was what is, you know, how do you get somebody saved? So, and she said Acts 2.38. So in Acts 2.38, there are two main requirements. One is repentance. Well, okay. And then the other one is what? Water baptism. So to get the Holy Ghost, in Acts 2.38, you have to repent. Repent of what? You have to repent of killing Jesus Christ. So it, go to Acts, uh, just, just read the next one there, or the previous verse. I'm sorry, Acts uh, 2.37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in, the, in their heart, and said unto Peter, uh, let's go to Acts, actually 36, I'm sorry. It says, uh, Therefore let all the house of Israel, notice it says Israel, know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then they said, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why are they saying, what shall we do? Because Jesus just accused them of killing Jesus. Or I'm sorry, not Jesus, but Peter just accused them of killing Jesus. Peter actually saw them kill Jesus. He was there. He, he saw it all. Uh, he saw the, the, the crowds gather and they say, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. So they, they wanted this murderer instead of Jesus. And so there's two requirements. One is to repent for killing Jesus. How many of you can repent for killing Jesus? How many of you were there who, can, who said, hey, I'm there. I'm 2,000 years plus old. Nope, none of you were there. So there's a problem there. And then water baptism. Now I'll give you, you could be baptized and then get the Holy Ghost. There you go. So... We've got that in Acts 2.38. You could, we could bring out a tub of water, and then we could dunk you, and then you could have the Holy Ghost. So because it doesn't say they got the Holy Ghost and then were baptized, it says, notice this, it says, repent and be baptized. So we assume that they got baptized first. Because it says, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. And then it's, it goes on to say, um, you know, about the promise and everything like that. And then... Um, uh, where, where they start speaking in tongues? Well, okay, so then after that, of course, we know that the tongues of fire came down and um, they spoke in tongues somewhere. That was in Acts 2 5, right? Oh, that was in Acts 2 5 to speak in tongues. So, so to be able to be saved back then, it says what? Okay, so in Acts. Um, 240, it says, um, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. So Acts 238 is saying to be baptized and repent, and then you get the Holy Ghost. So then, so move on to uh, Acts um, 8, go to Acts 8. We're going to look at another time when these guys got the Holy Ghost. 8.14. Okay, so Acts 8.14 says, uh, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So the, 
there were these, um, what happened was um, the gospel was being spread and then the, uh, there were some people who heard the gospel and then they believed the gospel. And so then um, Peter and John were then sent to the Samaritans. So notice earlier it said Israelites and now it's saying Samaritans. Those are two different types of people. Samaritans are kind of like a half breed of Jewish person. But um, so anyway, uh, and then it says, uh, who, okay, uh, verse 15, it says, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw, that's Simon Peter, when he saw that through laying on of, I'm sorry, through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. I'm sorry, that's not Simon Peter. That's another Simon. That's Simon the, uh, the magician. Yeah. Sorcerer, yeah. Um, yeah, the Holy, okay. So, I'm sorry, where was I? And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So what happened there? There, there are, uh, it's another giving of the Holy Ghost. And um, the requirements, so basically what's going to happen is um, these, these guys are going to speak in tongues and prophesy and, and uh, so on and so forth. They're going to show these signs to these, to these Jews. And uh, there are actually uh, more requirements. So in verse 12, let's go back to uh, verse 12. I didn't actually read that, but it says, But when they believed Philip preaching things concerning the kingdom of God, so they have to believe. So they, they have to believe. Okay. And then uh, there is water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's in verse 12. And then in verse 16, it says... Um, in verse 16, it says um, uh, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Turn the page, Jesus. So you have to believe, you have to have water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. And verse um, 15 says, and when they were come down, prayed for them. So you have to be prayed for by an apostle to receive the Holy Ghost. How many of you guys have been prayed for by an apostle? Not a one. That's terrible. So you have to be prayed for by an apostle. And then we have another requirement. You have to, be, you have, to have the laying on of hands by an apostle. Actually, technically, you could even go deeper and you say you have to be laying on hands by Peter or, what was it? Uh, who's the other guy? John. Amen. But... John, that's not that's not you, John. That's another John, John the Apostle. So we know that um, we we know that basically there are no apostles today because the Bible lays out clearly what the requirements are for apostles, and uh, basically they had to witness the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and they had to be there when John was preaching, John the Baptist. So, and none of us today witness the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and none of us today, um, wit you know, were apostles or disciples of John the Baptist. None of us saw that. So, those were two requirements that were laid out to call an apostle. So, what's interesting is that even though Paul, um, actually, Paul was there for both those events, so he he could have witnessed John the Baptist. And we know that because he, you know, he was called as an apostle. Jesus Christ himself called him um, on the road to Damascus. So at this point, both Jews and Samaritans, that's in verse 14, could receive the Holy Ghost. No Gentile could get the Holy Ghost at this point. At this point in the Bible, no Gentile had ever received the Holy Ghost. And what's interesting is that... Um, here just in, in, gosh, 
just in the next uh, little bit, or probably in the previous little bit, didn't the, uh, what's that one dude? He got baptized. Yeah, the eunuch. The eunuch just here in a second gets baptized. Philip, yeah, Philip, you know, he, uh, but, and how does the eunuch, yeah, how does the eunuch get saved? By just believing. So you have one group of people who get the Holy Ghost, um, you know, because they, they have their, their hands laid upon them. And that's, that's one of the interesting things about the book of Acts, is if you want to pick up a, a heretical doctrine, you can just go pretty much anywhere in the book of Acts, and you can do what they did, and you can make yourself a little church cult, and you can say, hey, you have to have me lay my hands on you. But you know what's really interesting? If they went by Acts 2.38, that wasn't there. So which is the right way? Is it Acts 2.38 or is it Acts 8? Do we have to lay hands or do we have to um, repent for killing Jesus? Both, there's water baptism in both of them. So notice that. There is water baptism in both of them. Do we have to have uh, an apostle lay hands on us, or can it just be anybody? Um, do we have to believe, or do we have to um, repent, like in Acts 2.38? So, so let's move on. So there's an inconsistency. It's not the same mode of, uh, of receiving the Holy Ghost. So go to uh, Acts um, 10. So we're going to... Look at another inconsistency. And the reason why, just so you know, the reason why it's inconsistent is because this is how they receive the Holy Ghost. And then a little bit later, other people receive the Holy Ghost a little bit differently. Why is that? Because God can do whatever the heck he wants to do. He's not limited. He's, he's not, we don't have a Calvinist God where you put him in a little box and you say, hey, this is what we have to do. Okay, at this point in time, the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's moving us from the Jew to the Gentile. You notice every time somebody's speaking in tongues, there's Jews there. It's moving Jews to salvation by grace through faith. Amen. So they're, they're going from being under the law to grace. Those are two completely different things. And so it takes signs. It takes wonders. It takes um, speaking in tongues. And that's why... You know, we, we have a complete Bible today, so speaking in tongues is completely unnecessary because it doesn't, it's not a sign of salvation. It's a sign for the Jews. So Acts uh, 10.43, this, this is one of my favorite verses. Acts 10.43. I'll tell you the reason why maybe some other time when I'm not as emotional. So Acts 10.43 um, it says, uh, to him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I want you to, uh, I'm going to talk about this because I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But basically what happened was um, Peter was praying and then he was interrupted by God and said, um, Oh, no, no, he wasn't praying. He was sleeping. And then he was interrupted by God in his dream. And then God said, hey, I want you to um, get up. And he said, I don't know. I think Peter said, I don't know if I was in a dream or a trance or whatever. But then he said, I want you to get up and go and I want you to see this carpet that I've laid out or the sheet. I think it was a sheet or whatever. And then there's animals in that. And then he's, God said, go kill and eat. And Peter said, wait a second, I can't just kill and eat these things. They're unclean animals. I, nothing, clean has ever, it, nothing unclean has ever entered my body. And that's a natural thing for a Jew to say. He, you can't just, a Jew can't just eat a hot dog. He has to eat a kosher hot dog. 